Aerial refueling, or in-flight refueling, is the process of transferring aviation fuel from one aircraft, the tanker, to another, the receiver, while both aircraft are in flight. The procedure allows the receiving aircraft to remain airborne longer, extending its range or loiter time. A series of air refuelings can give range limited only by crew fatigue and engineering factors such as engine oil consumption. Because the receiver aircraft is topped off with extra fuel in the air, air refueling can allow a takeoff with a greater payload which could be weapons, cargo, or personnel. Aerial refueling has also been considered as a means to reduce fuel consumption on long-distance flights. The first attempts to refuel an airplane without landing took place in 1921. In one famous instance, a U.S. Navy lieutenant in the back of a Huffdale and HD-4 used a grappling hook to snag a gas can from a float in the Potomac River. Another actual transfer of fuel from one aircraft to another was little more than a stunt. On November 12, 1921, Stuntman Wingwalker Wesley May climbed from a Lincoln Standard airplane to a Curtis JN-4 with a can of fuel strapped to his back. When he reached the JN-4, he poured the fuel into its gas tank. Needless to say, this was not the most practical way of refueling an airplane in flight. On June 27, 1923, at an altitude of about 500 feet above Rockwell Field on San Diego's North Island, Two U.S. Army Air Service airplanes transferred fuel from one to the other via a special hose. The airplanes were the Haviland DH-4BS, single-engine biplanes of 4,600 pounds. The refueling system consisted of a 50-foot rubber hose with a manual quick-close valves at each end that was lowered from the tanker. At this time, the receiver flew under the tanker and a man in its back seat grabbed the hose and connected it to the fuel tank. If the hose became disconnected, the valve immediately shut off the flow, preventing it from spraying fuel onto the receiving plane and its pilot. First Lieutenant Virgil Hine piloted the tanker. First Lieutenant Frank Seifert occupied the rear cockpit and handled the fueling hose. Captain Lowell Smith flew the receiver while First Lieutenant John Paul Richter handled the refueling from the rear cockpit. While only 75 gallons of gasoline were transferred, the event is memorable because it was a first. After six hours and 38 minutes with one refueling engine trouble in the receiving aircraft aborted the extended flight. The next attempt included a third DH-4 as a second tanker. On August 27th and 28th, with 14 Midair contacts, Smith and Richter flew for 37 hours and 25 minutes and set a world endurance record. The distance covered was 3,293 miles, but it was still a show when going in circles. To demonstrate the practical value of aerial refueling in covering distances on October 25, 1923, Smith and Richter took off from Suma, Washington, heading south and after four aerial refuelings, landed at Rockwell Field in San Diego just over 12 hours later. This border-to-border non-stop flight of 1,280 miles demonstrated how an airplane with a normal range of 275 miles could have its range quadrupled. In 1923, Army aviation had not yet recovered from the chaotic demobilization of 1919 and from its straightened budgets. As a result, early experiments with aerial refueling were dismissed as stunts, especially after November 18, 1923, when an airplane was wrecked and a pilot killed while trying to demonstrate aerial refueling during an airshow. This was aerial refueling's first fatal accident and, in the absence of a practical application for such refueling, for more than a quarter century thereafter it was also its only fatality. However, the pilot's attempts to attract attention to the mid-air refueling continued. In June 1928, Belgian military pilots set a new record for flight duration, over 61 hours also using aerial refueling. In 1929, the Belgian record was broken in the United States by an Army Air Corps Atlantic Fokker C-2A aircraft under the command of Major Carl Spatz. Before the flight, in order to capture the public's attention, 
The Army Air Corps stated that the aircraft would remain aloft as long as possible, and to highlight the point the aircraft was named the question mark. The question mark was a high-winged monoplane with two 96-gallon wing tanks supplemented by two 150-gallon tanks installed in the cabin. The two refueling aircraft were Douglas C-1 single-engine biplanes with two 150-gallon tanks for offloading and a refueling hose that passed through a hatch cut in the floor. The flight lasted from January 1st to January 7th. The question mark flew on a 110-mile racetrack from Santa Monica to San Diego, California. During the flight, they made 43 contacts with the tanker aircraft. In total, question mark received 5,700 gallons of fuel. In addition, the tanker crews passed 245 gallons of motor oil, as well as batteries, spare parts, tools, food, clothing, mail and congratulatory telegrams by means of a rope during these contacts. Neither the question mark nor the two tankers were equipped with radios because of a radio's weight and unreliability. The crews maintained communications via notes dropped to the ground, hand and flashlight signals and written messages displayed on ground panels and on both planes. With two of question marks, three engines nearly disabled, the operation ended after 150 hours and 40 minutes. The question marks mission portended little militarily. Based on the success of this air refueling mission, Army Air Corps officials scheduled a formal demonstration in the spring of 1929 as part of an Army war game maneuver. During the demonstration, the Keystone B-3A bomber was to fly accompanied by a Douglas tanker, from Dayton, Ohio on a simulated bombing mission over New York City's harbor and then return. But icing conditions forced the tanker to make an emergency landing in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, where it lodged itself in the mud. The bomber successfully pressed on to New York City and returned to Washington without the tanker's support. This operation was supposed to demonstrate the answer to the question mark. Afterward, as far as the U.S. War Department and Air Corps were concerned, the answer was, forget it. For the next 12 years, they did exactly that. These achievements inspired many pilots to attempt aerial refueling primarily to set records for long-distance flights. By June 1930, the record had exceeded 553 hours in flight requiring 223 refuelings. In July, the record was 647 and a half hours, almost 27 days in the air. Pilots lived in the noisy, cramped, smelly confines of their airplanes for weeks at a time without ever touching the ground, occasionally climbing out on special scaffolding to service the engines in flight. Despite all this activity, the technology for aerial refueling had not advanced significantly and pilots still used the clumsy and dangerous dangling hose method. Meanwhile, the widely publicized question mark operation had revived British interest in in-flight refueling, and in 1930, the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough initiated a series of experiments that continued until 1937. These efforts were less about extending range than about allowing aircraft to take off with a small fuel load and then refueling in flight. Initially, Royal Air Force officials expected that in-flight refueling would provide relief for flying boats, which typically had long, hard hull-punching takeoff runs on the water. Later, they expected that it would allow bombers to maximize their payload. At the time of the experiments, the hardest problem was developing a technique for the fueling hookup that did not demand unusual flying skill. But no alternative had yet been found for the elementary dangle and grab system of 1923. In September 1934, Flight Lieutenant Richard Atcherley was assigned to Farnborough. A member of the Royal Air Force Racing and Aerobatic Team, Atcherley had visited the United States in 1929 and 1930 and observed some of the American attempts at aerial refueling. Afterwards, he found the existing aerial refueling technique crude, clumsy, and dangerous and developed his own system, which he later patented. The Atcherley system had both the tanker and the receiver trailing cables with grapnels at their ends. While trailing its cable, the receiver flew a straight course and the tanker crossed its track from behind trailing its cable across the receiver's cable until the two grapnels connected. 
With the two airplanes now joined by their cables and flying side by side, a winch aboard the receiver pulled in its cable and along with it the tanker's cable. The refueling hose was attached to the other end of the tanker's cable and winched into the receiver where it was made fast to a fueling connection. With the two aircraft joined by a huge bite of hose some 300 feet long the tanker climbed to a position slightly higher than the receiver to put a gravity head on the offload, valves were opened and refueling began. When refueling was complete the receiver disconnected the hose and the refueler reeled it in. The cables were then disconnected and reeled in. It should be noted that actually reversed the previous refueling procedure and put almost the whole burden of the operation on the tanker whose crew would inevitably have more experience with refueling than would the crews of occasional receivers. The Atcherley method of refueling was further refined. It was based on this method that the famous British aviator Sir Alan Cobham introduced a workable system in 1938 which became known as the loop hose. But by then, as far as the Royal Air Force was concerned a need for aerial refueling, had been overtaken by events elsewhere. The modern airplane had come upon the scene and it changed everything. 